This series of podcasts is taken from a weekly book study group. The book under discussion is entitled Select English Poems by contemporary Indian philosopher A. Partasarthi. It explores some of the key concepts of the ancient philosophy of Vedanta. The book contains 20 poems in all. This series comprises several of these. The discussion is led by myself, Glenn Callahan of Vedanta Institute Los Angeles. Links to the websites of both the author as well as Vedanta Institute LA can be found in the description. They are respectively vedantaworld.org and vedantala.org. The poem currently under discussion is The Pond by Jane Taylor. There was a round pond and a pretty pond too, about her white daisies and violets grew, and dark weeping willows that stood to the ground dipped in their long branches and shaded it round. A party of ducks to this pond would repair to feast on the green water weeds that grew there. Indeed, the assembly would frequently meet to discuss their affairs in this pleasant retreat. Now the subjects on which they were wont to converse, I'm sorry I cannot include in verse, for though I've oft listened in hopes of discerning, I own tis a matter that baffles my learning. One day a young chicken that lived thereabout stood watching to see the ducks pass in and out. Now standing tail upward, now diving below, she thought of all things she should like to do so. So the poor silly chick was determined to try. She thought it was as easy to swim as to fly. Though her mother had told her she must not go near, she foolishly thought there was nothing to fear. My feet, wings and feathers, for aught that I see, as good as the ducks are for swimming, said she. Though my beak is pointed as their beaks are round, is there any reason that I should be drowned? Why should I not swim then as well as a duck? I think I shall venture and even try my luck. For, said she, spite of all that her mother had taught her, I'm really remarkably fond of the water. So in this poor ignorant animal flew, but soon found her dear mother's cautions were true. She splashed and she dashed and she turned herself round and heartily wished herself safe on the ground. But now it was too late to begin to repent. The harder she struggled, the deeper she went. And when every effort had vainly been tried, she slowly sunk down to the bottom and died. The ducks, I perceived, began loudly to quack when they saw the poor fowl floating dead on its back, and, by their grave gestures and looks twas apparent, they discoursed on the sin of not minding a parent. Jane Taylor. Despite the ending of, that, of the poem, this is not a, a poem about obeying parents or anything related to it, so don't go down that avenue. So the, the chick obviously represents all of us. Right? This is the chick is every one of us. The one theme that we keep coming back to, especially in the two earlier texts, um, The Fall of the Human Intellect and Holocaust of Attachment, is the necessity to develop the capacity to think. People go through life without thinking. When that happens, we follow a herd. Right? This is where the herd instinct comes from. What that means is that we don't put in any conscious thought force to determine what our next action should be. Right? The action is determined by the environmental influence and whatever our past momentum happened to be. If we did it in the past, we'll keep doing it in the future. And it's determined by the external environment because we will simply react based upon the mind's likes and dislikes or we'll act in accordance with what our peers and predecessors are doing. So there's been no conscious thought and I keep coming back to this definition of thought that he has in the Vedanta Treatise. Reasoning he's talking about, thinking. It's conscious thought force, not mere mental indulgence. So this notion of thinking, it's not just the entertaining of thoughts. Just because we're entertaining thoughts doesn't mean that we're thinking. Just because we're aware of thoughts doesn't mean that we're thinking. It's conscious thought force. So the majority of people, you know, this is one of the things that we hear often, is the majority of people are not thinking. The problem when it comes to the capacity to think and reason is that that is also at times only done in the service of the mind's preferences or the mind's desires. What happened, the phrase he uses is that the intellect becomes held hostage by the mind. So one of the ways you can think about this, and this is exactly what the, the chick is doing here. It's a bit like you take a bow and arrow, you knock, draw loose, and you hit the, you know, the side of a barn or you hit a tree. You then go up and you paint the target around wherever the arrow has struck. Perfect shot. 
Right? So the analogy of what's happening there is the destination has already been decided by the arrow. And then what you do after it makes it look like it's where it should be. You do the painting afterwards and it makes it look like that the shot was perfectly drawn. So in the analogy then, what's happening is that the mind has already decided the destination of the thinking, in inverted commas. Right? So the arrow being shot, that's the mind's, I want that. It lands at a particular target. And then what do we do afterwards? We do a whole lot of painting and justification to make it look to ourselves. Remember, we're not trying to justify this to other people. We're not trying to prove to others that I'm a good archer. We're doing it to justify to ourselves that the action that I'm taking is appropriate. It's okay for me to do this because, look, I've hit the bullseye. Well, you didn't hit the bullseye. Right? The mind just went to wherever it wanted to go, and then afterwards there was a justification of the fact. Now, when I say afterwards, I don't mean after the action per se, because all this is done only before the action. I'm talking when I say afterwards, what I'm talking about is after the decision of what to do has already been made. In essence, what we're going to see in, this, in the poem here, that the chicken has already decided to go swimming. Right? So uh, it's a little bit like the analogy that we have um, when we talk about the distinction between mind and intellect. We always give that same example, the diabetic and sweet. So when you hold the sweet out to the diabetic, the mind has already decided... I want it, I'm taking it, in a sense. The intellect has to be present before and during that process to stop it from happening. So this is the same thing that's happened here. The chick has already decided to go swimming. All she has to do is justify it. One interesting question is, before we sort of get into the phenomenon a bit more, is why is it that she needs to justify it? So, for example, if she wants to go swimming, why doesn't she just go swimming? Why does she have to spend all this time thinking about it and justifying it and coming to a conclusion so she can be satisfied, it's okay, I'm allowed to go swimming now? Why doesn't she just go? There is a part of her that is not in line with what the mind wants. One of the ways to interpret it is to say that it's the conscience that knows it's not the right thing to do. Another way to interpret it is to make it a bit more literal from the translation, from the text. It's her mother that has told her. It's her mother had told her. Though her mother had told her she should not go near, she foolishly thought there was nothing to fear. So her mother has already told her not to do it. So the mother in the poem can represent the sort of authority figure. So because there's a relationship with that authority figure, a sort of a surrender in a sense, or a recognition of a a difference in position, you naturally, you sort of take your advice or you take your orders or you, take, you let your life be influenced by those who are above you. And so because that relationship is there, naturally there will be a resistance to doing whatever that authority figure said. So you can think of it more literally, just because a parent said so, but yes, you can also take it beyond that because in fact he uses the idea that the, the parent is like scripture. People ignore scriptural injunction. So when the poem says you should not go swimming, why? The question is why should you not go swimming? Well, because it's detrimental to your well-being. You know, the, the parent is not trying to just impose its will willy-nilly. So the scriptures are those texts which are an exhaustive description of the nature of the human experience and it guides us towards higher and higher states of evolution, ultimately taking us towards self-realization. That's basically what a scripture is. And that same advice will be embodied, as it were, in our conscience. So there is this resistance. There's something that needs to be got over. Right? You can imagine if the chick was, you know, if the chick's too young to understand the mother, don't go swimming. The chick's too young to, doesn't even understand what that means. There's no resistance. She doesn't ha she's completely innocent because she doesn't have even the capacity to understand the word don't go swimming. And so the notion of not swimming and not being allowed to do it and it being the wrong thing is completely absent from her. So there's no hump to overcome. When they're very, very young, 
one wants to go swimming, and she just goes. And you, but the thing is, you never blame the infant, you never get angry with the child, because you recognise they're simply too young to understand what's going on. So in all of us, there is something which is saying, don't do it. So the effect of acting against the conscience is, in general, negative emotions. And that comes from either performing actions that we should not perform, or from not performing actions that we should. Both of those conditions will result in these negative states. So this is why the chick has to do all of this reasoning, quote-unquote reasoning, because there is this hump, there's a barrier, there's a resistance to going swimming somewhere in the personality, but the mind is so strong that it demands to be satisfied. All right, and so the chick has decided swimming is what I'm doing. And then what happens is that she justifies that choice. So the problem is that when we are having our intellect um, held hostage by the mind, we won't know. We'll think we're playing the game of reasoning, but we don't know what the rules are. We don't know how the pieces work. We don't know how the whole thing fits together. We're just playing around with thoughts, just moving thoughts around to entertain ourselves and to get to some you know, satisfaction. This is what we're doing. We're moving our thoughts around. We won't know that we're in that position. That's the problem with this position. Intellect is held hostage by the mind. It means the intellect can't see anything outside the periphery of the desire, and the desire will be satisfied. When that intellect is not held hostage by the mind, when you are objective to the desire, then you'll know that I'm objective to the desire as well. One of the ways that we can potentially avoid this problem is by recognising that we will have the tendency to allow the mind to hold the intellect hostage when we lack humility. Right, there's a the saying I heard Swamiji use once, I don't know if it was his or he got it from somewhere else, arrogance is the ramparts of ignorance. So our arrogance is that I know. I know what I'm doing. I'm smart enough to know what's going on. It's, the, it's that feeling of I know something. Now that is the ramparts. You know what ramparts is? It's the protection. Okay, So the archers would be up in the ramparts firing down below. So it's the, um, it's the, the guardian, the guard wall. So you, our arrogance is the guard wall of our ignorance. Our ignorance is being protected by that arrogance of I know. So humility works to directly oppose that fear, that notion of I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm talking about. If the intellect is weaker than the mind's desire, then the intellect can be held hostage. That could be happening to me right now and I wouldn't know it. The moment you ask that question, you're stepping out a little bit of the, the periphery of the desire and just sort of trying to imagine peeking in from outside it. What's happening in the instance of the chicken is that her intellect is completely contained only within the periphery of the desire. So everything that the intellect does is only in the service of that desire. It's like a fish caught in the river. Now the fish can feel like it's trying to go left and trying to go right and trying to go backwards and with the rest. It's only going where the river is going. It doesn't have any other options because it's too weak. A jet boat. A jet boat genuinely has the freedom to go upriver, downriver, left, right. Fish doesn't have that freedom. It might feel to the fish, oh I'm I'm swimming upriver. But the actual direction of the fish is you're moving downriver. So it is. If the mind is overpowering the intellect, then the intellect will agree with the mind in the same way that a fish agrees with the torrent. So the, the mind is that torrent. Yeah. So this can be applied um, generally. It's a general practice of bhakti, of devotion, is to efface that egocentric notion of I know. So it's a a long-term, ongoing project. But also, when it comes to, a, as you pointed out, a dilemma of choice, when it comes to a specific definition, when we're trying to figure out you know, the correct course of action, it's essential that we recognise 
I am a chicken. Now, at whatever level we're at, wherever we have a strong preference or a strong desire, we will be susceptible to this exact phenomenon. The only time that we are not susceptible to this phenomenon is when the mind is always under the control of the intellect. And that is not the case that probably anyone that you know lives in. It's always sort of slipping in and out depending upon the strength of mind. So any time we have a dilemma of choice, one of the things that we should be aware of is the pond. That because I have a strong desire for X, Y, Z, the tendency will be for my own reasoning to be biased towards X, Y, Z. So by recognizing that I have a desire for this, my apparent reasoning will be influenced in that direction. So by recognizing that, you sort of gain that humility. Like, my intellect's not perfect. I do have these strong desires. I have to be aware that sometimes I'm going to be wrong. So that awareness is essential for us to hold because that'll help us to correct for that. We can discount it from our thinking. We can put more effort into creating counter-arguments. You know, should I, shouldn't I? So anytime we're you know, trying to decide something, a, a really powerful tool is a pros and cons list. Why, what are the reasons to do this? What are the reasons not to do this? Right now, if I have a strong desire to do it, then because of that, I know that my, to do, my, reason, my reasons supporting doing it is going to be a long list of them. Yeah. And my reasons to not do it is a short, very weak list. So I might spend five times longer on my reasons not to do it than I would on my reasons to do it because I recognize I have a strong desire to say yes. So because I have a strong desire to say yes, I need to spend four or five times as much effort on the reasons why no, just to balance out that bias. One of the other things that you can do with regards to that is try to imagine the absence of the desire. Let's say you're at a, a, a gathering, you know, it's a, a semi-formal social gathering and they serve you some food and they serve you dessert and then, and then the host says, anyone, would, anyone want seconds? Yeah. Imagine that you had zero desire for extra chocolate cake. You had no desire whatsoever for it. What would you do? No, thank you. Yeah. If it was before the dessert came out, you might say, I've got no desire for dessert, but they're bringing it out for everyone and uh, they're kind of making a big deal because it's a special type of dessert, so I'll take a piece and I'll eat it. It's kind of my obligation to eat it. In that case, fantastic. It's my obligation to eat it and I also want to have a piece of cake, so great, good. So if you can visualise what you would do in the absence of the desire, that can make it clear, or a little bit more clear, the extent to which you are choosing only based on the desire. Because if you don't have a desire, then all of the reasons that you've given to take it, to say yes, would be as valid in the absence of the desire. But when you take the desire out, all of a sudden those reasons look a little weak. So this is what's happening, that we have a weak reason, but when we look at it in the background of our desire, it appears strong. It's a good reason. Mm -hmm. It's a good reason to say yes. It's not a good reason. It's a weak reason. But it appears to us to be a good reason when you put it against the background of I also want to do it. But when you take that background of I want to do it out, then the reason itself starts to look a little weak. So if, this is a good way to check if you can visualise what it would be like not to have the desire to do the thing at all. So if you look at the sixth stanza, is my feet, wings and feathers for aught that I see as good as the ducks are for swimming, said she. Though my beak is pointed as their beaks are round, is that any reason that I should be drowned? So if you look at this, there's two things here. One is that she's talking about things that have absolutely no connection to swimming. Actually, she's absolutely correct. No, beak shape would have no influence on whether or not you, you, you would drown. So she's absolutely correct. The problem with that, of course, is that it's completely 
irrelevant. So this is how the intellect is being used in the service of the desire. I'm giving some nonsensical you know, um, reason, again, in inverted commas, reason why it's okay to do what she wants to do. So in terms of how do you ensure that we're not being influenced in this way, again, the long-term solution is develop the intellect. It's the intellect which understands the broader context of the situation that you are in. It's the intellect that understands the questions that need to be asked. This is not a question that needs to be asked about Beck's shape. So the, long, so the intellect will just start to function the stronger it gets. It'll just naturally be able to see. You know, again, another analogy that sometimes is used for this is the difference between being in the maze and raised a few feet above it. You'd see a maze that everyone was inside, and at the very centre of the maze, there was like a, a raised tower with like a terrace on top. And if you could get to the centre of the maze, you could get into the tower and go to the top. And of course, once you're a few feet up, aha, being above raised above the maze, just a few feet, all of a sudden you can see yep, the wrong approach, right approach, right approach. When the intellect is developed, it just naturally rises above the situation. And then the correct questions to ask becomes child's play. When the intellect is sufficiently strong with regards to that particular desire, you'll understand the components of it, and you'll understand what needs to be asked. But again, that's a nice long-term project. But when it comes to our own issues in the moment, we can again just return back to this poem and return back to this phenomenon and recognise that what the chick did here was to ask irrelevant questions. So again, thinking is conscious thought force. It means it's directed towards a particular result. Uh, you don't know what that result is. Knowledge proceeds from known to unknown. But you know what you want to figure out. So and the question here is, should I go swimming or should I not go swimming? That's what I want to figure out. So the first thing you have to do is be very explicit on what it is that you're trying to discover. Spend some time shaping the question so that it is as direct and pointed and clear as possible. So you know what it is you want to figure out. So this is the first step that you know when it comes to the practical application of this particular idea. What do I want to know? And the next question you need to ask is what are the factors that I need to understand in order to ask the answer the question? Should I go swimming? Well, what do I need to figure out in order to answer that question? Now this is the step that the chick did not do. Just randomly started answering things like beak, beak shape is different. There's no reason. Yeah, but that's not relevant. You shouldn't be bringing that in. So asking ourselves the question, what are the relevant factors that contribute towards making this decision? And then address them one by one. The other thing that we see happening here is she says, my feet, wings and feathers as good as a duck's are for swimming. Well, that's, again, fundamentally wrong. A duck has webbed feet, perfect for swimming. Chicken has claws, perfect for scratching on the ground and digging up you know, insects and worms. Terrible for swimming. But again, this is something that happens. We gloss over the facts in our hurry to get to the conclusion it's the right thing. We only hear what we want to hear. Anything which we don't want to hear, you know, gloss over it or we sort of dismiss it or we downplay it, there is something called, I think it's the backfire effect, which takes that even one step further, as it were, which is that when we hear evidence against our bias, we tend to hold that bias more strongly. Mm. The mind has the attachment and the desire for a particular belief or a way of thinking or a way of living or whatever it happens to be. Because I'm attached to that, anything which comes in opposition to it, I don't see as a friend, I see it as an enemy. So what do I do for my enemies? Put the ramparts up. 
When an enemy approaches, I put up the protection. So the only reason I see evidence as an enemy is because it will force me to relinquish my attachment to the idea that I'm attached to. And so the problem is that we aren't willing to learn. This is the, the biggest problem. Again, it's that I know. So the following stanza really shows the whole key for this. The final line of the stanza, I'm really remarkably fond of the water. So the trick even brings it out explicitly here. So that tells the story. That indicates the, um, the driving force behind the whole conversation that she's having with herself. And the effect is, as you see, so we're making the choice based upon the mind's preference. Now what happens in the trick is that the moment she's made the decision and goes in the water, she immediately sees and the moment she sees it, there's that, you know, there's that regret. There will be times where you recognise the choice that I made was basically straight out of the mind, and now I'm suffering for it. If we can take those recognitions and reflect upon them, then that can give us some inspiration to redouble our efforts in questioning the decision that we've made. So that, again, highlights the, the scariest part of this, right, is that... While the chick is going through this process, it feels to her like she's reasoning. It feels to her like she's trying to figure something out so she can arrive at a conclusion. Now, from our perspective, when we look at this, we know that that's not the case. She's not trying to figure anything out. She's just trying to justify it. So that's the, the most potent part, in a sense, of this whole thing here. That while we're caught up in our minds, it will feel like we are not. And it's just a, a daily practice of increasing the strength of the intellect. So you'll see these things functioning much more, uh, much earlier and with more clarity. So. And again, recognizing that it keeps functioning at different levels. As you get a a higher level of objectivity than what you were, good, you're objective to everything below it, but you're still involved at that level. So get a more objective, good, you're objective to that now, but you're involved at this level. There's always a level of involvement somewhere along the lines, which is again where that quote comes in. If you know that there's a better way to think about it, then your thinking is correct. It's in the right direction.